It'll be. Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately called IPA USA. IPA USA is a USA affiliate of the International Play Association. And as part of our efforts to promote play, we've introduced Porch Play Chats, which are conversations with people who are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find all the Porch Play Chats on our website at ipausa.org. Up in that top right-hand corner, follow us on Instagram, be a friend on our Facebook page, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and magically, every Monday morning, a new Porch Play Chat will appear in your feed. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm president of IPA USA. With me on the porch is Rachel Laramore. Hi, Rachel. It's good to be here again. I know. We're so happy to have you. Rachel's an educator, consultant, speaker, researcher, and author, and also the editor of the e-journal for IPA USA. Her work focuses on the intentional integration of nature to support young children's holistic development by learning with nature to expand their worlds and live, live ritual lives. I, I mean, that's just like the best mission statement ever. <laughs> She's written three books. Establishing a Nature-Based Preschool, Preschool Beyond Walls, Blending Early Childhood Education and Nature-Based Learning. And she's the founder and chief visionary of Samara. Is that, do I always say that right? You can say it either way. That's the lovely thing. Even if you look in the dictionary, it's Samara or Samara. So, okay. Okay. Well, either, I, whatever, whatever you're moved to say. Whatever moves me, which yeah. is Samara or which learning. is the floating Samara or Samara, right? I love it. Let's just yeah. do that. Exactly. <laughs> and um, Samara Early Learning is an organization focused on helping early childhood educators. That means you guys start nature place, nature based schools. Oh my God, this is only the second one, or a nature based approaches into their existing program. And prior to founding Samara, Samara. She spent more than a decade starting and, and directing one of the first nature-based preschools in the U.S. So, I mean, really, she has lots to share with us. So Rachel's topic today is um, creating a sense of wonder outside. Yeah. I yeah. Like I mean, uh, particularly thinking about like, well, if, if folks are watching that have a school thinking about the play area but even right at home thinking about how do we use the outdoor space uh, but it could be indoors too but i you know always i love for it to be outside if we can mm -hmm. but thinking about that as as a space for play that goes beyond just physical play mm -hmm. To really thinking about that sense of wonder and that sense of wonder comes in all sorts of forms. It doesn't have to be, I, I think often we first go to sort of science and awe of nature and that is true. Um, yeah, but there's other, there's even just like wonder about each other and having moments as a group, right? And um what researchers call that collective effervescence that people talk about, like at a concert, right. Where you're just like feeling it as a group, but that can happen too when you're outside playing with your friends. And so I think it's just thinking about, especially in a play area, moving beyond just the physical um, and physical play is important. I don't mean that. Right. But there's just, we, we, we limit ourselves if that's all we think about when we provide space and time for children to play mm -hmm. um so it's like okay how can we what what materials can we add even features or places to visit that aren't just a climbing structure but have like open-ended materials that children can use in all sorts of different ways but they also there's spaces for them to meet with their friends and and just like whoa wow you did this I did you know tell stories like all of that is play and playful right sometimes we we get so stuck in just running up the slide or running up the stairs and and swinging and that's, that's limited 
it's yeah. And sometimes I think children, some children don't feel like running around when they're outside. So what can they do? What's an option for them? I I remember I used to take a blanket out and we had pea gravel. That's how old I am. We had pea gravel. So I took a really thick blanket or quilt out and a basket of books. Yeah, and exactly. I sat on the blanket or <laughs> quilt and children would come and we would read stories together, right? That yeah. was, I, I mean, they don't always have to be, we want them to be physically active, but sometimes they just don't feel it. And right. so I'd much rather them, you know, be listening to something they're interested in or um, we would always collect rocks. Yep. And so, uh, and I, and I go back to my childhood where a neighbor that my mom would drop me off with while she went to visit someone else. <laughs> I can't remember the woman's name, but she had a jar of buttons. Oh. And I played with buttons for hours. Yeah. It was fast. Sorting them, stacking them. Who knows? Weaving Who knows? like yeah threading I mean, all sorts of stuff rolling them on the edges uh, yeah and so one of the one of the things that made me think of different rocks is this amazing things you can do with rocks yes and and so we would have a bucket of diff different shaped rocks and children would bring them and add them to the bucket because they yeah. I found a rock to put in the bucket oh wonderful right and so, what's so great about that is I mean they're still physically active, right? They're running around like, oh, I'm going to run over here and get a rock and I'm going to come back. And, but now it isn't, I'm, I mean, it's sort of like adults, right? We don't like to go to the gym and do exercise, right. but like, oh, sure. I'll go like hike up to this, you know, overhang so that I can see this beautiful, you know, sunset or whatever. Like, uh, yeah, I want to collect awesome rocks. And, um, and so there is physical activity, but then there's, this wonder. whoa look what i found this one's huge or this one looks like you know a monster <laughs> it's just all the other imagination or we could we could put all these rocks and make something out of them you know and that's what they would sculpture do. yeah absolutely they'd be over in the corner of the playground with the rock bucket and you know i'm hearing what people are saying oh my god they'll throw them at each other they didn't right <laughs> um we talked about what do we do with our rocks, right? So right. we sort of let, put the parameters around. We don't pick them up and toss them. There's other things we can pick up and toss here mm -hmm. that won't hurt our friends. But, you know, these are things that you can play with. You know, and we the three rules, we keep ourselves safe, we keep our things safe, we keep our friends safe. <laughs> it was, that was all encompassing, right? Exactly. And so... It, sometimes we're we're too overprotective and we need to they can't judge what is dangerous versus what is risky if we're constantly protecting them so uh please yep. just kind of consider that as your absolutely well and also the, the question of like oh they're going to throw them at each other well if that started then i would wonder what do they need right now? Yeah. Right. Is it, they need more materials. And so they're fighting over a lack of materials mm -hmm. or um, is it actually that they just want to throw stuff yeah, and they kind of want to see how rocks bounce off of things. And it's like, okay, how do we make that into a yes? Like we can't see if we, we're not going to test to see if this rock will bounce off of Deb, but we <laughs> will try something else, right? Like we can, we can still test that idea in a different way. Like, how can we do this more safely? Right. Like well, and they could have target or whatever. Yeah. Yes. And they could have been at the lake and they've been skipping rocks. Right. Yeah. And they're right. just imitating, right. What they did and repeating what they did at the lake. Exactly. So, yeah. So I think sometimes we're close minded in, overly safety conscious so how else could we bring wonder well i was just thinking about as you said that deb that being at the lake and skipping rocks uh -huh. right that is a moment of and, and here's a way i think of sense of wonder instead of this sort of oh i, I don't know we we sort of have this 
big ominous the sense of wonder as though it's this special thing that we're always trying to reach for. Sometimes I think it's easiest to think of sins of wonder as those moments of, whoa, wow, cool, right? Uh-huh. Like those are moments of wonder for children. Like, whoa, how'd you get that rock to skip across the, the pond like that? Do it how again, you, you know? That's yeah. been a long way. How'd you do that? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Like that's one, that's a sense of wonder. That's those moments of, wow, what, you know, huh? What's that about? Finding a tree down that wasn't down a month ago. Yeah. What do you think happened is what they're asking, you know? Exactly. Look at, we could climb over it now. When it was upright, we couldn't climb over it. Those are all what's under, you know, what may be living underneath it. Where do the animals go that were in it, right? So, yeah. I mean, there's so many things yep. that we yeah. can extend their wonder about when we just take them on little walks. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially after it rains with all the worms that come up and all the fun stuff that comes up in the spring. Oh my God, yeah. so cool. Yep. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, nature is prime for it, right? We're, oh, yeah. we're more likely to have those moments. Partly, I think, because it changes what the situation for us as adults. Because mm-hmm. if we're out on a hike or, you know, just a walk through the woods or a walk through our community, our neighborhood, I don't know what we're going to find. I'm I'm just as surprised as the children. And so it, I think that changes the dynamic a little bit to start with. Mm-hmm. But then also like, the scale is so different in in nature like you talked about the tree being down so there could be this whoa this tree fell and it's this huge impact look at its roots (laughs) and then there could also be this tiny little ant that is just working its way through the bark that a child is working on right and it's all of the scale in between there's so much opportunity in in different sizes within that as well so there's just and it changes every day you could visit the exact same space every day for all year long, and it would be different in some way, right? The weather's going to change it, the plants and animals that have come by. And that's part of the wonder also is like, why are the, the leaves are different colors today than they were yesterday? And and it's subtle changes. And that's where the the like daily wow start to happen like wait a minute why is this a little bit you know the edges are browner or you know what like of the leaf or something is changing that way or huh the the ants aren't here anymore they were here yesterday or they're moving slower or yeah the worms like you said like now there's worms where these worms come from you know how'd they get here yeah And, and so i just think about the season that we're going into which is fall right and so Sometimes we think, which is another one of my pet peeves. I mean, how many years do they need to learn about fall, right? There's so many. I mean, if you took them out on a walk, right, before the leaves start to change and you're just, what, you know, walking through and when they come back, what color were the leaves while we were out there? What noticing about where where we're going? What see in in the grass or what do you see and then take them out when the seasons begin to change what what's different than what we saw i mean my god right there's so much i mean i you know yeah we spend every fall we talk about oh the leaves changing and sort of why they change and (laughs) and oh okay i mean mean, that's important i don't i'm i'm not dismissing that like (laughs) it's important to understand science these wars but and, yeah, there's wonder. I mean, I've been going out this, this last week because I've started doing more watercolor. It's my new, my new adult play thing. I've been like, yeah. I'm going to watercolor and it's perfect for the fall because I went out looking for leaves and I'm like, wait a minute, these leaves are full of multicolors, like in, and the pattern that really happens on an individual leaf. And I mean, I just, I very slowly was just walking and I was looking at the ones on the ground, like picking up these leaves, like, whoa, I want to make that. Like, how do I do that? And so, yeah, sometimes it's actually just slowing down Mm -hmm. and taking our time to notice 
right? Yes. And helping children become good observers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to be able to see the difference, you know, we, it, I would hope that every seasonal change, you would go on a walk and you would say, what are you noticing? And the teacher would have a clipboard and she'd be writing down what children are noticing. And then you would come back and you say, okay, you told me on our walk that you were noticing in this season of spring that this is what you noticed, right? And then that goes up somewhere in the room. And then we go out and we do it in summer. What are you noticing? Yeah. Exactly. And, and then you do it in the fall and then you do it in the winter. And my God, look at all the learning. Exactly. And then, What's different? What's the same? Oh my goodness. It, yeah. uh, that, that is how we deepen children's learning and their prior knowledge, right? Instead right. of leaves change colors in the fall. And yeah. this is why, you know, oh, come exactly. on. Right. Yeah. And I've seen, I mean, you talk about those going on a walk or like noticing what we're seeing at different times. You know, I love the idea of wonder walks where it's just, we're just walking to see what we wonder and, and are in awe of, right? Like, Oh, what's that? What's that about? Um, but cameras are fun. Now you can get pretty inexpensive digital cameras mm -hmm. for children and like, let them, what, what are they drawn Pictures. to? Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, if you want to keep going with that, right, you have these photos of what you've taken and then, okay, here's printouts and let them make collages or build, you know, whatever they decide, like continue that noticing and wonder in other ways. Like, so then now it comes out in creative and artistic play and, um, or maybe storytelling, maybe it inspires some, oh, let's tell the story about what happened with this. I don't know, this animal that we took a picture of in the woods and where did it go and what was its life like? Or so, yeah, it doesn't, there's ways to keep going and, and, and encourage play and all of that noticing and wonder. And you really, if each child has a digital camera that day or one child has a digital camera on the wall that day and everybody gets a turn with a digital camera, wow, do you know what that child's interested in? just based exactly. on the pictures they took. Yep. Now you've and, truly gotten what matters to them mm -hmm. and what their interests are. And it's a beautiful way to learn about those interests and then to be able to think, okay, what could I do to increase this wonder? Exactly. For this child, what materials could I bring into the classroom? What materials could we add outside? Should we go on walks more than once a week? Exactly. Right. Oh, yeah. That's ultimately the way to really follow children's interest and mm -hmm. support their support their interest and curiosity and play. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So if we wanted to maybe maybe we're maybe. OK, OK, I can take kids out on a walk and we can say, what are we noticing? Yeah. And um, I'll have a clipboard and I'll be writing things down and maybe somebody will have a digital camera. And they can be in charge that day of taking the pictures. And, and then, okay, so maybe on our existing playground, I can add some things that might bring in wonder. I, I, I remember we had a sandbox, of course, and of course we had to cover it every night. But in the sandbox, sometimes I'd bury things mm -hmm. in the sandbox. And I'd say, I wonder what's in the sandbox today. And they go, huh? They go running over and then sometimes, you know, a child would bring something to school and she and she or he would say, would you bury this in the sandbox for me? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, there are, you can make magical things out of pretty much anything yep. outside. The other big thing that we had outside were bird feeders and that was a, such a sense of wonder. And that's what I was going to say. I think in this, this may panic or freak some people out, but I think thinking about ways to make habitat for plants and animals in your play area. Mm -hmm. And I know it's like, what? You want me to encourage things to live in our play area? Yeah. Right. So you, if you have a log, like that, that's a rotting log. And this is why natural materials are, I think, better than plastic. Right. Uh then 
like all of that life that's happening mm -hmm. and the decomposition and then what's living under the log and uh -huh. we can roll it over and look. And then of course we can put it back. So then tomorrow we can see what's there tomorrow and mm -hmm. bird feeders and um, insect houses and little gardens for butterfly gardens and um, you know, toad houses and uh, things that can, can wander in and out of your play area um, mm -hmm. that support more of those moments of wonder and rather than sort of these sterile manicured play spaces that just aren't that interesting they might be interesting for a day or two and then they're the same the next day mm -hmm. where if we have more of those natural materials they're changing and so the space changes and we have more of that wonder and sometimes we can create that wonder with other materials and features right we can add some things like you're saying in the sandbox but if we have more of the natural materials there as well we don't have to do as much work as teachers like nature's done it for us thanks i'm tired <laughs> you know like you do it <laughs> when i mean think about having trees yeah exactly and, and plants yeah you know, when we I grew up with grandmother who had who let me play with mud and I had baking rats and I'm sure every poisonous berry I picked and used it to decorate the pies or the cakes that I was making uh, that she had in her backyard, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, if you could find plants that flower and what, you know, you're going to see that cycle throughout the year and some plants flower in the spring and some plants flower in the summer and some plants flower in the fall and and so you could see so much better than just the okay now we're in fall I mean they can't they need to see it experience it feel it touch it smell it exactly yeah and to, yes exactly and to see on a more personal detailed level I mean you're talking about flowers and when they bloom and but to notice the difference between the way the rose petals all sort of fold in, right? And how many there are versus like an aster, you know, where you've got all these little, it's like all these little flowers within a flower. And what's that about? And, um, you know, if I, wow, if I pull them off, there's hundreds versus 10. And, um, mm -hmm. and that, that having that available to them to really get in there and experience, um, it's just so it's it's powerful and it's necessary because we can tell I can tell a child this is how many petals a rose has and they're like okay I don't care right <laughs> you know yeah. but to get in there and experience it themselves and have that moment of whoa this is cool or look how they they kind of fold and then there's different edges on the petals or I don't like just what they're drawn to Right? Oh my goodness, yes. And they smell nice many times. Oh nice. Right? Exactly. And, and they feel, I mean, just rose petals feel. Yeah. And and you know, so I I want us, I want you to think about not, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. I want you to think about what can we do? What are we willing to try? Right. What are what's our little baby step way? Yeah. Of doing this. And you know, the one of the other things that I think that you find on those walks, if any of you are into project-based learning or into the Reggio Emilia sort of approaches, I mean, going on a walk and asking children to come back and say, what did you see? Yeah. What do you want to know more about? Oh my goodness. The most incredible way to pick up on children's interests and to be able to build on what they're interested in learning more about versus saying you know this month it's dinosaurs well okay but why right exactly kids are interested in dinosaurs yeah so um <laughs> what else how else should we look at this in creating wonder on the playground i think we've given tons of suggestions how else should we think about how to approach you know parents are like what are you doing building a tree i can't afford a tree you know we're short staff i uh, have to pay my teachers more so is there i'm wondering you know how when you build a new house they always come and put a tree between the sidewalk and the street yeah 
Or I wonder if there's those programs available to folks that are maybe have a child development program that doesn't have a tree between the sidewalk and the street. And would the city come plant a tree? Yeah, um, there for sure possibilities like that. They might. It's worth yeah. asking. Yeah. Could do you have a family that owns a nursery that might be willing to donate a tree? Could you do a fundraiser that would help you mm -hmm. put more plants and nature on the playground? And even if that feels like too much, like get a planter at the <laughs> dollar store, you know, and put some seeds in it of who knows what and see what happens. See what you happens. know, it's like, okay, there's, I spent $3, you know, $2 in seeds and a dollar in a bucket. Oh, and maybe you're gonna have to get some soil too. So $5, you know, and that's a start. Like it's something that moves beyond the climbing, just the climbing structures, not anti-climbing structure, but you know, having yeah. a mix. Um, <laughs> having a mix is important. They need that climbing structure every day for longer than you let them be on it, right? Right. But there are also children who need other things. Exactly. Exactly. And so what are some of those others? And I think the other place I really encourage people to start is Think about what you have inside that children play with mm -hmm. and how could we bring that kind of play outside? doesn't have to be exactly the same, but man, they really love to build with blocks inside. How can we have building and construction available outside? They really love reading and being in the library and cozying up with a book. How can we have that cozy space outside? Do we add a hammock? Do we have a little free library in our play area that they can always get books from? Um, you know, they really are, they just, art is their passion and they always want to be doing art. Okay, how do we offer art outside, right? And have materials, of, and because it's different experience, it's kind of the, the same kind of play, but what they're experiencing and the wonder they're having is, will be different in those different settings. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. And it's not out the playground in summer. It's not just for water play. Right. That's a great thing, but that's not the only thing. Exactly. As always, this has been amazing. I love talking with you. It's great. It's always fun. <laughs> so um, stay right there while I close this out. So to learn more about IPA USA, please visit our website at ipausa.org. And until next time, keep on playing.